Okay. Let's take our conversation to you. I want to take you from Nigeria now. You, interestingly, why you are very critical to this discussion is because you've been to UA, you've been to Dubai precisely. Uh, you've lived there for a while. You've had uh, business concerns and several activities going on there for you. Now, the cost of living in Dubai, according to this report, has been of concern. You know, it has been the heaven when it comes to tourism. Um, the city has been in the world map in recent time because of the activities around tourism and then the vision of the leader. But it's also posing another challenge, which is the cost of living in that city. Give us an overview of your own personal experience, having lived in that city, and what would be your own estimation before I give you the figures about the cost of living. Well, I think uh, UAE generally is... Um home to a lot of people across the globe. Uh, over 190 countries uh, patronizes that uh, environment. So people come from everywhere to do business in the UAE. And that's because the government uh, made a, a kind of an ecosystem that's conducive for business. Uh, we've said here over and over, it's a tax haven for a lot of people because there's no corporate tax in the UAE. Uh, there's no even personal income tax in the UAE. So people who work, they take their salary full time. If you do business, you take your profit and you can move it anytime out of UAE without issues. So, so a lot of business people go to the UAE to do business. And this is uh, because UAE is a commercial center. It's not an industrial center, so to speak. Almost everything that you get in the UAE is brought in from chicken to fruits to vehicles. Every, it's just like, you know, a shipping hub for the whole of uh, Africa and the Middle East. So a lot of things come in here. And the UAE has a way of also negotiating with corporate owners in terms of pricing and the rest of it. But you see, what we're talking about today is that as the logistics challenge hits the world, the effect is directly and straight to those economies that are dependent on imports. So with over 1,000 degree increment in the prices of goods in the last two years. So as the global crisis are thriving, the prices on the ground also is going up. And the other thing that you are told that will not be affected is uh, the real estate. But also find out that most of the real estate owners are also not indigenous. They are partnering with the locals to build those houses. So as the cost of living is going up, cost of housing is also going up. And this is the challenge that a whole lot of people uh, will face today as we speak in the uh, United Arab Emirates. Okay, now according to the reports from the United Arab Emirates, now uh, top causes of stress. Now this uh, current cost of living rising has been uh, put at 45% as the cost of stress for a lot of persons in the UAE. This stress uh, is definitely is going to be uh, health issues for some if not managed very well. But let's look at the implication of the inflation rate in the UAE. As you have said already, it's like a commercial hub uh, for Africa and the rest of the Middle East. So what's going to be the implication for people who come there to do purchasing to resell, particularly for some African countries. A lot of um, uh, people who buy goods for textile uh, do go to the UAE for shopping. What's going to happen? Yeah, a lot is, a lot is happening to that economy. Don't also forget that that's the point I'm making. Was a, a shock globally. Every economy is affected. Now, the worst it is always those that are almost 80 to 90 percent dependent on imports. Now, you look at it for close to two years going now, 
the portal for Nigeria has not even been opened for people to travel from Nigeria to go to do business in the UAE. That has been sealed for a while. So a lot of people who have been coming from here to go and buy, Nigerians are big shoppers. And the UAE knows that. So there's no way it will not affect even the local making of money in terms of people who are selling, in terms of tourism and the rest of it. And that's what it is. People are struggling with business internally. And I think that's where the stress is actually coming from. Because you are having people, some year, about a year ago, Russia, during the Ukrainian war, they all moved a mass to the UAE. And they brought in a lot of dollars into the economy. Now, by now, those dollars should have been exhausted. So you really need people to patronize. So it's one thing to have a goods on this and have somebody else who is going to buy it. Now, if you put the cost of ticket and the whole of it, the cost of visa together to get to the UAE, even from Nigeria, for example, is quite expensive. So not many people can afford it. Flying Emirates from the US to the UAE, all these prices are affecting the way businesses are done. Naturally, it would have been easy to spread the cost of the inflation if you have a whole lot of inflow of people coming because the economy is dependent on those who visit, not on the residents. So this is the challenge. So there's no way uh, people who live right there will not be mentally stressed if you don't have money to spend. And uh, you're living in an environment that's so regulated that uh, you have to pay every bill, whether to government or to landowners. So these are the things that, of course, will necessarily create mental stress for a lot of people that are living there. But how it will affect, actually, the Emirates is another big question completely. Because over the, over the years, these guys have established themselves because you have an environment where out of the 10 million people that live in the UAE, about uh, 8.5 million people are foreigners. Only 1.5 million people are original own, uh, indigenous in the Emirates, and they are well covered by the things they do. In the last uh, uh, two or three months, all the business partners we had in the UAE, they've been chasing us also because the system is really stressed. All right, let, let's situate this conversation properly by looking at the statistics. According to this report, a single person estimated monthly expenses at about $1,000, and that's about 3,700 dirhams, excluding rent, just for one person. And a family of four will spend three times more that's about $3,540 uh, monthly, which is equivalent to 13,000 dirhams. I want you to react to this. Do you find this to be very, um, to, just too expensive for an average uh, dweller in that place to afford? $1,000 monthly, excluding rent for an individual. And if you look at a family of four, it's about $3,540. That's pretty expensive. $3,000, that's about 9,000 dirhams. And what do people earn? Maximum people who are working and they are doing excellently well, uh, averagely 10,000 dirham per month. There are people who are earning less than 1,000 dirham. There are people who are earning uh, two, 3,000 dirhams. So if you are earning 10,000 dirhams in the UAE, you're almost a middle-class person. And then those who are very techy, they get up to 45,000 dirhams, but then that is on the extreme. So, averagely, what a man is going to take home, if he's taking 10,000 dirhams in a month, and I'm going to spend... Uh, About 9,000 9, of food, 
of transport, you know what that is. Excluding rent. Excluding rent. Not because to talk of. Rent is, if rent you now convert this to Naira. quite expensive. So you may even have some deficits. Rent is quite expensive. Even in the slum area of UA, like in Dera, rent as of 2022, 23, is over 90,000 dirham per annum. That's about thirty thousand dollars. Even our highbrow area in Ikoye, you can't pay that much for a duplex, and that's for uh, what we call a room self container here, one bedroom flat. So you can imagine that if you're living in a studio apartment around that area, that market area, that's like our Oshodi. You're seeing people paying up to about 35,000 dirham per annum. Some people paying 45,000 dirham per annum. That's huge money. And that's why even in those areas, you look at it in a, a Dera area, you go toward um, Sharjah, you can see 12 people living in the same one uh, studio apartment. Because the cost of affording this is very terrible. There are a lot of people who are underpaid in the UAE, especially people who are doing labor. They don't even earn up to $500 in a month. So you can imagine how these people survive or how they are surviving. So what would be the implication of this on the uh, UAE economy? Those who don't earn as much to take care of the inflation cost and to also have something to hold on to, at least just to get by. Do you see possible relocation of uh, a lot of um, residents or a lot of people who live in the UAE apart from the citizens themselves? Where are they relocating to? Those maybe, in Nigeria are maybe crying. Maybe looking for somewhere, somewhere <laughs> cheaper to live in. Uh, Angolas are crying. You see, this is uh, one of the things that I say to so many people, especially with this Jackpa syndrome in Nigeria, that the cheapest place to live on the planet Earth is actually Nigeria. Many people don't understand it. They, they feel, oh, there's better opportunity anywhere. Where are you going to run to? You want to go to America? You want to go to Paris? You want to go to Germany? The cost of living is twice what you are talking about in the UAE. So it's not just about moving. The question is, where are you going to move to? That's a problem that is not as affected as the United Arab Emirates itself. You see, the beauty in the UAE is the fact that it will still be cheaper for a lot of people because it's still a tax haven. We are not asking adding corporate tax to the cost of things. So imagine that they were going to be putting tax on some of all these issues because they are still doing... Uh, their VAT, which is the 5%. So, if it's only VAT that is put on the cost, it will still make the prices better than even within the uh, GCC countries in the Middle East. So, not really people living, is the ability of people to survive. And this put pressure on government facilities, especially the hospitals. Where, of course, doctors will have to cope with the issue of depression. And you know, that's a very big challenge for every advanced economy. That once people start to think suicide and it is putting burden and cost on the government. So these are the things that are going to be the likely fallout of what you are seeing. Where are they going to go? Want to go back to India? Or you want the Lebanese to go back to Lebanon? They cannot. So they had to remain and find a way to cope with the stress. And that's why you see the world is trying to see how to create an economy that's all inclusive, where everybody is catered for. But unfortunately, technology is creating that great divide that it's not possible for government to actually balance up life for people. All right, let's go back to this uh, report. There's a kind of uh, comparison between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, the cost of living in Abu Dhabi, which is a bit lower than that of Dubai. 
you know, that of um, Abu Dhabi is about $900. So it's a bit lower. It's just like we're trying to compare Lagos, the cost of living in Lagos with Ogun State. It's just the reference here. Talk to us. Why do you think Dubai could be more expensive than Abu Dhabi? What are the sort of attractions, you know, to investors and to dwellers? Where, what makes it so unique or different from that of Abu Dhabi? Yeah, Dubai is the commercial nerve center. Just like taking uh, Lagos, Abuja. And of course, also by way of the design, the way Abu Dhabi is designed, like, it's like, you know, a GRA setting. You don't have uh, so many high rises in Abu Dhabi as you have in the UAE. So the real attraction is that a lot of people come to Dubai. And for you to live in Abu Dhabi, you must have been elite also. So I think that's, a, that's actually the difference because the migration comes more to uh, Dubai where the basic businesses are happening. And not many people can actually afford to go to the GRE, which is where the king is, and that's uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. So you still have suburbs within um, these other seven other Emirates, Emirates that are within the uh, UAE that people can still go to uh, Ajma, people go to Sharjah, you know, all of Al Asakeman, all these areas are also uh, places that are less developed where cost of living also is down. And so many of our people are actually living on the outskirts of, the, of Dubai because Dubai is expensive because that's where you receive almost everybody who come to do tourism. Okay, let's look at um, the other countries in the Middle East. Now, for um, Saudi Arabia, the uh, cost of stress when it comes to current cost of living uh, and the inflation is put at 47%, even higher than that of the United Arab Emirates. And then globally, it is still at 47%. This global inflation, what's actually are the causes? And how, why is the impact on countries different? Well, uh, the impact has to be different. And uh, of course, that also has to be based on the macroeconomic phenomena across countries. Uh, people have different tax systems. Uh, monetary policies are different. And all of all these regulatory framework different across country. So that also will affect the impact of what is happening. You take, for example, if you take Africa as a case where our leaders are struggling to look good to their creditors, which are with our countries, and to prove to them that they can collect money from their people. Taxes are very high. And you also see uh, rates of loans also on the rooftop. So you can imagine a country like Nigeria where people have to borrow money and they have to pay up to 28%, some people up to 31% to do business. Now, if you are taking that money and you are going to import something, that is coming from uh, maybe uh, Russia, or coming from uh, France, or coming from China. Apart from the logistic you are going to pay for, you're also going to pay for the cost of capital. And then, of course, you also have to pay for the bad internal logistics that is in here. So this pushes the price high. And raises the inflation rate within this kind of a climb. But you go to some places, taxes are well reduced, lending rate is uh, single digit, some 5%, some 9%. In short, some places is actually minus one. Because you have to encourage people to take loan so that the money in the banks can come into the society 
especially with people who are facing deflationary trend. And like also in business persons would like to know those places. Where yeah, they, like in Asia. Where they encourage people yeah, to but it has their own. <laughs> it also has their own negative. Because what it is is that if you are doing business and nobody is buying from you, really, what government is actually doing is trying to see how they can subsidize the cost of your capital. I take some. It's just what uh, we are called in during the COVID period bailout. So it's a kind of a bailout mechanism. So that's the monetary policy of China at the moment, trying to see how to bail out businesses who are producing. But the demand is not corresponding to the supply. So this is a, it's an economic issue, problem, both for the state and for the companies themselves. But here, you're seeing COVID-19, the biggest corporate that spoiled the world. And it came unannounced. The whole world was shut down. And the greatest beneficiary of COVID-19 were shipping companies and ship owners. It's a record that the profit they never made for some of them that have lived 50 years, some of them 100 years, since inception, they made that profit in a single COVID year. Because they determine where vessels are going to go through. They determine who got containers. And so the glut in the logistic uh, supply chain became the real big problem. That whereas if you're taking a 40-foot container to Nigeria, you pay 4,000 US dollars before. Immediately after the borders were open, after COVID, it became 12,000. So that mark increase in the cost of freight affected the cost everywhere across the board. And now the world was trying to settle down. We got into the Ukraine war. The prices of gas jumped to the high roof, creating trouble in the whole of Europe. So imagine that you're sourcing something from Europe. So the cost of energy rising, that affects the cost of production and that automatically also affect the ex factory cost of the product you're selling. So these are all issues. And we are thinking of ending the Ukrainian-Russian war, and we are having the Houthi rebels disturbing on the Red Sea. Vessels can come. So the problem is compounded by the day. And that's why inflation is climbing. Because as cost of production increases, and countries are printing money to accommodate these increments. You have so much money supply. With excess money supply, chasing very few goods, the net result is inflation. Let's look at the success story of UAE. You know, it started with the vision of one man. What are the lessons for world leaders? What are the things they need to imbibe when you look at the success story of UAE? Within a decade, there's been a turnaround. What should be the lessons for world leaders making reference to the success story of UAE? Well, I think UAE was born by one man's idea who saw tomorrow. Revenue was coming from oil. And they had independence. And uh, they were fighting like every other place. And they said, why are we fighting ourselves? Let's come together and build a common society. And that's what translated into UAE today. And they have their independence in the 70s. And they've been making effort to think outside of the bus and build a society that is the 
talk of the town, really, to so speak, because you have over 20 million people visiting. <laughs> For tourism, just to see big projects. So it's the foresight. And the story of UAE, for me, what we can learn is that for every heart that is willing, nothing is impossible. Oh, yes. Because the, the real issue which we face here. The current ruler of Dubai was saying, oh, my father had a very big vision, and then he talked about how they decided to build and did everything, but most fundamental element, which is stress, apart from the vision of the man, was the people who believed the vision. So it's not just enough to cast a vision. How do we mobilize people to believe or buy into the vision is the biggest issue in change management. And that's where our country, for example, had not been able to do well because we create too much suspicion we have not been able to build trust across the divide so that people understand to say this is where we are going. And fundamental to every change management also is your ability to communicate your compelling vision. Now, most states cannot communicate their vision but it's beautiful, but you cannot sell it to the people. And so you don't get buy-in. People who are listening to it. So but they have a man here who sold a very compelling vision to the citizens, and the citizens accepted the vision. They bought into the vision, and everybody has been running with that vision. So that for me is what it is. Visionary leadership transformatory leadership. Now, when you look at UAE, what you see is value for human beings. Stress-free life. You get to every bus stop because the sun is heavy. Every single bus stop in the UAE has an air condition inside it with sitting arrangements. So even when you are waiting for a bus to come, you are waiting for a train to come, there's a place you can sit, fully air-conditioned. Why you wait? Okay. Because you're thinking about the people. So that's what is important. And if you don't think people, and you are thinking things, you cannot build civilization.